All right. Welcome, welcome. It's nice seeing you. Probably good. Yeah. <laughs> Love you too. Right. Well, welcome. Uh, I, it's nice seeing you from a different angle like this. Uh, you're usually the other way. It's very disorienting from up here. Uh, uh, so I'll do my best. Um, so I went to the other classroom with about 10 or 15 minutes left, and there was no one there, which in my mind's indication that time wasn't a problem. Okay, good. That's the reason why I try to have a simulated exam, uh, because I want you to, to see that on this exam, time is not your enemy. Uh, you have three hours. Did anyone, how many people finish in roughly an hour? Hour and 15? Full 90 minutes? Okay. So I think you'll find that not everyone needs the full 90 minutes. All right? So my goal for today is to go over the A plus answer. And I'm going to, I can't count, so I'm going to count you to figure out, you know, to pass it around. Try and do this more efficiently than the roll, because then everything's going to make it way around the classroom. Uh, or how many times to try. Uh, uh, this is the, um, this is the actual make of the fat side of the room, too. And there should be more than enough. I've read some more students than are on the class. Okay, don't worry. And I have it up here in case you, you don't didn't get a copy whatever reason, but it'll be helpful. Okay, so the, the exam, I'm sure as you found, one at a time, the exam as you found was more or less very similar to the past exams. Um, all my exams follow a fairly similar format. They give you the choice of law, they give you a fairly robust and complicated fact pattern, and then they give you very specific questions at the end that I want you to answer. And each of those five questions at the end hit on one of the topics you've covered in this class. Um, I'm not going to surprise you. I'm not going to give you something you've never heard of before. It'll be different than you've seen it in class. That's, that's for sure. I'm not going to give you regurgitating class material, but it'll be a twist on what you've already studied. So my recommendation, how I want to structure this review session, and, um, is to begin by walking through the question as I think you should probably read it. Okay. Um, everyone has a different exam style, and everyone reads differently and thinks differently. So I don't want to tell you how to do this. I will tell you how I think it's best done, and you can do with that as you will. Right? So starting off, reading the question itself, give yourself a solid 20 minutes to read the question. Um, again, if time's not a factor, you don't lose anything by reading the question once, reading the question twice. Because the more you read the question, the more likely are you going to catch what I'm asking about, right? The biggest mistake students make is they start writing too quickly, and then before they know it, they have all these paragraphs that are not really responsive to what I'm asking for. So really take your time to read the question. I, I, I put a lot of effort into making the question as clear as possible. There's going to be some stuff buried, but, but it's there if you look at it well. All right, so again, uh, this is the cover sheet. This will be identical on, on every exam ever given. Uh, again, totally open book, print whatever you want, books, commercial outlines, I really don't care. Whatever you want to bring, it won't help. I think you probably realized that after doing this, this exam. It, it, it didn't help, which is why I make it open book. Uh, exams that are not open book are, are very different, and I'm not interested in that. Okay? All right. So uh, if you have time, you should probably do the first one. as has a lot of marriage law questions and community property, but I want to focus on the second one because it has some... Uh, future interest, which is something that always gives uh, law students the most uh, angst. All right, so again, so we have question two. It's always worth 50%. The exam format stayed the same since I started teaching here. All right, and the prompt. Okay, so you're a law clerk. Okay, so the second you know you're a law clerk, you think, okay, I'm explaining something objectively. If you're an associate, you may be explaining something to persuade. So there's actually a different frame of mind to put yourself in. Okay, so you're, you're a law clerk for Judge Doug Dougie. Uh, uh, in, in a court in New Jersey. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, I have a preference for New Jersey cases, although that's in no way dispositive what will happen uh, in two weeks. Uh, you have some case involving misappearance of some plane. This is like the air, the air of Malaysia, which happened last year around the same time. 
and you have four characters. Uh, I'll always try to introduce the characters up front and list all their names. That way, I'd recommend in your notes where you put the four names, and this is A, B, E, and F. They're almost always alphabetical, and you know who you're looking for. Um, I'm not going to bury this. I'll tell you right up front who are the people. Again, this is, I can trick you on other stuff. I'm not going to trick you on this. This is not worth tricking you on. All right, so here's the setup. You've been asked to write a bench memo. Everyone know what a bench memo is. A bench memo is a judge to bring to the bench. That's what a bench memo is. Uh, you've been asked to write a bench memo of no more than 500 words discussing some case in New Jersey. All right. Again, always 500 words. That's not going to change. Uh, um, I promise it will be 500 words. And that's 500 words each, not 500 words total. I once had a student who wrote for both exams a total of 500 words with 250 each. That was not a good idea. 500 total for one question. Okay. So then I'll tell you what your choice of law is. And this sometimes gives students a little bit of angst. Uh, uh, but when I say common law rules, I'm talking about restatement first of property. What do I mean by this? Basically, all the common law rules. And this only came up in a few different contexts with respect to you know, marital property uh, and a few other scenarios. You'll know if there's a difference because in class, I made a point of saying there's a difference. right? This is where having a good outline, where in your outline you say, OK, here's the common law rule, here's the modern rule, you can juxtapose between them. So here we're talking about you know, common law rule. Um, I'm almost certainly going to do something like this. I mean, I haven't, again, I haven't written it yet, which was deliberate, because uh, I don't want to influence it subconsciously. But I will almost always ask you about things in different places, common law and modern law, or different times. All right, the reason why I'm asking you about at different times is because of future interests, right? Future interests happen when various conditions occur. So this will be happening over some period of time, OK? Also, and again, if you go back to my uh, past exams, I'm probably going to ask you something about the first three weeks of class, right? Pearson v. Post, the whale case, remember all those, right? I will ask you something about natural law and how you find property in the absence of positive property rights. I, I've done it every year. I'll probably do it again. Uh, I will probably ask you something about economic efficiency. We talk about that at great length, you know, whether you reward the hunting of the hunter or you reward the certainty of the guy who actually catches the fox, right? We discuss this at great length. So you have enough in your toolkit to discuss this. Uh, this one, this one is particular. I may not do this, but, but I'll, I'll probably do something like this. Um, we, we didn't really cover statute of limitations too deep, and I told you and promised you I won't test you on it. Right? So I'll either do something like this and say RAP doesn't apply, or I'll make the question where it's obvious RAP isn't an issue. Uh, this case, which spanned like 800 years, I knew some students would attempt to say rule against perpetuities, right? So I, I clearly exclude that. Even though under the rule against perpetuities, conveyances made before RAP are not bound by it. So RAP wouldn't even apply. But I, I want to, <laughs> I didn't want anyone to be tempted to talk about RAP because that, that, that was not what I wanted to test on here. So I would first read you know, these two paragraphs in the instructions and go through my past exams. I always do something very similar to this. Then I'd recommend you jump down. Jump down to what I call the prompt. And if you've ever taken any standardized test, you know what that means. And usually they're numbered. So you see here, questions, right? At this point, you don't know what the hell the question's about. But my prompts are very specific. Okay, I think there's a couple different philosophies of testing, right? Some professors give you a very long fact pattern and say, discuss the issues, right? Well, there are pros and cons to that. And, and in, in my, when I was in law school, almost all the questions were discuss the issues, right? I think that kind of test really allows you to show your creativity, but it makes it impossible to grade. Because student A and student B can go entirely different directions and still have good papers. My goal is to make it as easy as possible to compare one paper to the next so that there's fairness in grading. That, that's, my, that's what I strive for. Okay? So that's why I give you a fairly rigid frame of what I'm looking for. Right? The flip side to that is give me what I'm looking for or else you'll lose a lot of points. When you have the discuss question, you're really open-ended. You can go whatever angle you want. You may go down the wrong path. Who knows? But here, I want you to give me what I'm asking for. Don't, 
don't try to get cute by a half and like go far afield. Because one, you probably don't have words for it. And two, I might not give you, you know, the credit I'm looking for. Right. So question number one, what does it say? Uh, okay, so this is, you're like, what the heck? Okay, 65 million years ago, so something's up, right? Dinosaurs, who knows? So you're talking about some kind of dispute, uh, uh, jurisdiction between Jurassic. Uh, you're probably thinking, oh, this is probably involving the savages, the Johnson case, right? Something you're drinking is like, wow, this is like from, from the, you know, beasts and animals, like some, something natural law-ish, right? So this, this question actually doesn't give you too much of a hint. Uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, but that's about efficiency and fairness. So that probably says, oh, it's about hunting. I bet you know we know those hunting cases with with whales and foxes. The first one's not too helpful in this one, at least. It's a little bit probably confuse you. Okay, so then we see question number two. Oh, here we go. We got present and future interest. Right, this is our this is our bread and butter. Um, and we see okay, so we bookie, you know, B F the king, right? You should put something in your margin saying, okay, we're looking for the various present and future interests for these for these three individuals. That's a useful thing to keep in mind as you're reading through it. Right? If their character is not mentioned here, I'm not concerned about their future interests. So it's like one less thing for you to worry about. Okay, and again, I, I repeat it very clearly, do not apply the rule against perpetuities. Because I really didn't only want to mess that question up on that point, so I made it abundantly clear. All right, so we go to question number three. So the Montpelier Foundation, is actually, that's actually the library of James Madison in Montpelier, Virginia, uh, wants to sue the situation, right? Now, we don't know exactly what it's for, but we know that there's something about c copyright and misappropriation of property. So we did a case on that. Well, that was the INS first AP case, right? That was about sealing the news. So you have to say, okay, yeah, there's probably something about stealing some news information from James Madison. So you're, you're putting yourself in the right frame of mind, okay? Okay, so we have question four, right? It says, uh, A brings a suit on behalf of Bookie Estate. So it's like, seems like Bookie died. Someone has an estate, they're dead. Okay, that's a, that's a hint. Uh, against the t-shirt shop from lawful appropriation. So this should be thinking of the Vanna White case, the, the Samsung versus uh, uh, White case, right? White versus Samsung case. All right, then we come down to question five. It says, Queen Elizabeth II, QE2, if you want to be cool, uh, who's apparently on Twitter now, although if you look at her first tweet, it didn't come from the device she used. I think it was a fraud. It's true. So the Queen of England and her distant heir, King John, are suing over some <laughs> land called Runnymede. And, and we discussed this, but quiet title means you file suit in court to assert who the lawful owner of a piece of land is. Okay. Uh, 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 E intervenes and files suit that says situation heirs own it. A intervenes and claims that someone named John owns it, right? So at this point, we know there's some sort of battling dispute for running needs, so you should keep that in your mind, right? So at this point, you've read, and I'm doing this really slowly, but you've read the uh, prompt, you've read the questions. That's probably taking between five and eight minutes, give or take. I, I'm really stretching this out. So we're under 10 minutes for the, you know, the prompt and the, uh, uh, you know, question. At that point, you read the question itself. And I want to walk through this somewhat faster, but uh, with, 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 with deliberate. So the situation, no pun intended, is that you have four friends on an airplane. The airplane gets sucked into a time warp, into a wormhole. Uh, and this is my deus ex machina, my, my tool to explore you to different periods of historical significance that I am a fan of. So first, they show up, and they're 65 million years ago, and they are in the time of the dinosaurs, the terrible lizards, uh, as, as, as they're called in Latin. And they see that, wow, these animals are not dumb. They're intelligent beings. And they have a king, and they have a court, and they have all these other things. So uh, the, ki the, the, the king of the dinosaurs said, by what Rex means king, in case you know that, uh, the king of the dinosaurs said, uh, you're not welcome. Scram. And F says, F that, right. I, 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 am, I, I, am, I am the kingdom of the Jersey Four. And he ignores him. So at this point, you should think, okay, we're, we're, we're having a Johnson versus Macintosh issue, right? Where you have some sort of savages of various intelligence. And you have people who are trying to conquer them, trying to discover them. So there are different ways that you can approach uh, uh, this issue. 
Okay, then we have the next paragraph. In case you didn't notice, my paragraphs are very deliberate. Each paragraph represents a new idea, right? Generally speaking, that's how paragraphs are used, but to state the obvious, this will help you break apart your thought process. Um, one tip which I recommend is if you actually number the paragraphs, right? And then in your own scratch notes, you can say facts about running meter in paragraph four. And this way you can quickly jump to the paragraph that has those facts. So when it's the happening is when you get to write your exam, you're not rereading everything. You can jump to the specific paragraph. So you might want to, you know, at the start, just number your paragraphs, uh, which, which, which may be helpful. All right, so, so yeah, we have a conflict. So Rex has this elaborate method of hunting the dinosaurs. They would mark off areas of the jungle they would hunt. And the other packs would hunt, would respect the markings they have place. And this prevented overhunting. So 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 what what is this? This is Demsets. We did that article about the Native American tribes would mark different parts of the forest for hunting of furs, and that was a way of preserving the livestock so they wouldn't have overhunting. So again, this wasn't a case we studied, but we did discuss this at some length. Okay? But situation uh, uh, stumbled into his jungle. Um, he didn't care much for his rules. So we have a situation where Rex is tracking down a raptor. He corners him, and then you know F thought about it the last minute and grabbed him. He strangled it and he he took it away. Okay, Th this is Pearson v. Post. In case you didn't realize it, uh, uh, with a little bit of a twist. So we have a situation of who gets it: the hunter or the jerk. In this case, the situation is the the jerk. So we have this lawsuit filed in the uh, Jurassic Supreme Court, and then the situation again says that they're just savages and they're not, you know, they're not real people. Yes, they're not people, but they're savages. And he wants to civilize their society and makes his own court in their land. So this is again a Johnson versus McIntosh issue, which feeds back into the previous paragraph, right? Are these people entitled to have their, their rules recognized? If you recall in Johnson, the entire point of the case was these savages were not able to convey land, right? They didn't have that stick in their bundle. They weren't able to exercise the rights of civilized people. Therefore, they couldn't transfer property. Can people who transfer property create a court? You know, I, that, that, that's, that's the issue what we're going for. All right, so then this Jurassic Supreme Court gives a judgment for, whoops, sorry, too far. He gives a, a judgment for Rex, uh, and then the Jurassic Supreme Court says, listen, we should, we should encourage and create incentives for the hunters. This is the Pearson descent. And then the uh, uh, GTL, that's Jim Tan Laundry, in case you're not aware. Uh, the GTL Supreme Court gave a judgment for the uh, jerk, and this is basically the uh, uh, the majority opinion in Pearson. Okay, so our wormhole reopens. Now we go to part two of the question. Uh, they're they're sent to some meadow along a river, and in case you didn't know this, this was Running Me. This is where Magna Carta was signed uh, last year. Magna Carta was actually at the Houston Museum. I hope many of you saw it. Um, if you haven't, please try and see it somewhere. They're touring the U.S. This is the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. It's a very momentous occasion. All right, and then of course at Magna Carta, King John was forced to sign the Great Charter by the barons on the threat of death. Uh, they said, "Sign this or die." Uh, so King John signs it, and then he he gets uh, smitten by the beautiful bookie with her with her hair bump and her uh, leopard print tights and all the other Jersey paraphernalia. Um, uh, so he asks Bookie to marry him, and she says yes. So after the wedding, uh, uh, he executes this grant. And this is, this is where you have to start paying attention to the language very, very carefully. So it says, Runnymede, uh, from King John to Bookie for life, comma, make sure you follow your commas. I'll try to remember my punctuation. Then to situation as heirs, but if, but if situation does not survive Bookie, then Runnymede, King John and his heirs. We'll go over this one in, in a few minutes. There's a couple different ways to read this, which is one thing I want to convey. There's not one right answer because we have various tools to interpret these, but I think there's some better answers. Okay. So then two months later, she realized she's pregnant with King John's child, uh, which was conceived on the wedding night. Okay, so Bookie's unborn baby, which is in existence, is now the heir to the British throne. And the fact that it said King John and his heirs, you now have to know that, that Bookie's carrying around a potential heir. And we, we even said that in utero can inherit property. We, we, we've discussed this at various points. 
Okay, so then they're sent to one of my favorite time periods, 1787 in Philadelphia, uh, with the drafting of the Constitution. Um, and you, I hope you know this, but during the, during the uh, Constitution Convention, James Madison kept a private diary where he took these very detailed notes on the convention. And these are basically the most authoritative record of what happened. And in, in fact, James Madison had told his wife, Dolly, not to publish these until after his death. So they weren't published in the 1850s or so. Um, in our alternate world, uh, the situation sees this book, this diary, and he sells it to the Pennsylvania Packet, which was actually the, the second leading newspaper in Philadelphia after uh, Ben Franklin, uh, Pennsylvania Gazette. Ben Franklin was a printer. That was his main vocation. <coughs> So Madison's annoyed that he stole this. He said, listen, these are secret. You're not supposed to publish this. Uh, uh, and he files a lawsuit against him in court in New Jersey. And this is, again, there was no copyright act. That didn't exist for another, you know, however many years. So the suit was brought on common law misappropriation of property claims. Okay? And again, if you remember, one of the three questions was about misappropriation of property. You should probably put that paragraph number in your margin next to that question so you can connect the two. Okay, and we see the situation ignores the lawsuit. Okay, then, then the sky turns dark, they get zapped back to the future in the year 2014. Uh, a bookie is a celebrity, she's famous, you know, they start printing up these t-shirts. And on the t-shirts is a picture of a dinosaur, an attractive female dinosaur, you can use your imagination what that looks like, with makeup, leopard tights, and a hair bump. And it's, you know, a hashtag, you know, GTL, gym, time travel, and laundry. Um, Snooky, Snooky, Bookie gets annoyed at this uh, at this misappropriation of image. Can't believe I made it that long without slipping. That's that's, good, that's pretty good actually. Uh, yeah, and she sues them for unlawful appropriation. So again, this is the Vanna White case. Okay, then then we take a turn for the science, you know, for, for, for the thriller, and uh, a Bookie goes to England to Runnymede, which she claims she still owns because she thinks she has a life estate and she has been alive for eight hundred years, give or take. Uh, the Methuselah, right? So, and the situation comes with her, and then they decide, let's go to Buckingham Palace, let's visit my cousin, the Queen, right? Because she thinks she's still the Queen, and sorry, Prince William, but uh, Bookie's child is next in line to the throne, uh, uh, whatever. It actually bothers me immensely we have another King George coming, right? The last time we had a King George, it did not work out well for this country. We had to fight a revolution, so I'm not looking forward to another King George in the, in the uh, British monarchy, but... I'll start throwing teams to the harbor if I need to. So, into Galveston Bay, whatever it is. Okay, but then, uh, then there's a riot at a football game, soccer, if you will, and they are simultaneously killed. Um, for whatever reason, in my exams, people often die violently simultaneously. Um, and the reason why they die simultaneously is because I don't want you to see who died first. And I'm trying to test you on this. And miraculously, the, the British National Health System with with some delay, uh, was able to deliver the baby post-mortem. And that's actually medically possible. In cases where the mother dies and they can deliver the baby within a certain enough time, the, the, the child can live beyond the mother. Um, so this creates this weird gap for the purposes of a life estate where the mother is declared dead and then the heir comes later. And that makes lots of fun things for you to wrestle with and, and think about. I think I've asked that a couple times. And they call the baby John II. Um, one historical footnote, since King John with Magna Carta was such a disgrace that he gave all this power to the barons, no monarch has ever been called John after that. It was considered like a, uh, like a, like a cowardly name. It's never been a King John. And we have King John II. All right, and just to clean up the loose ends, A is now the guardian and the executor of Bookie, and E is the executor of all the estates claims, okay? Uh, don't, don't fight that fact. Just assume it works. Um, also, don't fight this next fact. Uh, assume all the cases can be brought in the same court. There's no statute of limitations. There's no jurisdictional defects. Uh, Judge Dougie has jurisdiction over everything. He's that rotund, uh, and everything fits inside. Okay. So now he goes to Magna Carta at the museum. Uh, too late if you haven't. It's not there anymore. Uh, and he, he, he sees that um, there's a code, the, the, the Jersey code, and he flips it over, and when he sees it, he sees this grant, which was written in 1217. All land that's been granted by the king will never eschiat, revert to the state, but will revert to the heirs of King John. So basically, any land that King John gives can never go to the state. It will always re revert 
to the heirs of King John. This creates a very difficult situation if King John has no heirs, though, because this effectively nullifies the Eshiat uh, doctrine. That's not at issue here, but this could be a really tricky conveyance, because if there are no heirs and it can't Eshiat, where does it go? But we do know he has an heir, or will he? Okay, and they check, and I just to cover the loose ends, because I don't want someone to say it's not effective anymore. It's an effect. All right? Everyone with me so far? So any questions on the fact pattern itself? Maybe? Uh, probably not, because the answer is it's really messed up. I don't think so. No, I mean, I... I could. I think the answer would be the condition is struck on a restraint and alienability. I think that'd be the answer. But yeah, I don't think I'd ask that. But but it, this this formulation does create some problems. All right. So let's let's take this one one question at a time and walk through the A plus answer. And 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 to preempt this. Uh, this part of the class always gets very, uh, uh, let's say, feisty, because people say, what about this, what about this? And my, my preemptive response to that is, uh, I am happy about that. Um, if you know this material well enough that you're going to get different ways of answering the question beyond what this student did and are correct, you're doing something correct. Right? You've prepared well for this course. You know your stuff. Um, so if your answer differs somewhat from what was put on the, 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 the sample answer, um, don't fret, don't worry. There are various ways to tackle this. We studied, by my count, almost 100 cases this term. And there are very often different cases that might be drawn on to answer these questions. Right? Um, and someone says, oh, but why is that the A plus? Well, first, first of all, uh, you didn't see the other answer. And I don't remember this particular student, but maybe the first answer was better or worse, I don't remember. Um, also, you have to think about the entire exam as a whole and from each question, each, each point. So even if one of the answers perhaps is lacking, they made up for it in the other answer. Um, I can't recall, but usually I think I explain each question with 50 points. You know, there are five sections, each worth 10. Usually to get the highest answer, you have to be somewhere around a 90. So I'm guessing this person got like 44, 45, 46, somewhere in that range. So even, even if, say, they got 45, 46, they're probably a couple nines, a couple eights, and maybe a 10. So, so, I mean, even then, a couple of the answers probably are not perfect and probably aren't even excellent. They're, they're, they're good. So maybe they got like, you know, one 10, two nines, and two eights or something, right? That probably puts you on track for an A or an A plus. Yeah, and then I, I haven't looked at the person's uh, scoring, so I don't recall. And I don't even remember who the student is, so uh, I'll take that for what it's worth. All right. All right, so let's do question number one. Okay, so it says the issue has been moved for 65 million years, and then we have to figure out this dispute between Fituation and Rex. So the question here is really twofold, right? I'm asking here about the jurisdiction of the court. What I'm really asking is, is this a society, excuse me, that's civilized enough to create a court, right? Is this a society under Macintosh that's legitimate enough to actually create laws that we have to obey? Okay. Then it says, was the jurisdiction valid? Okay. Then we have to say, you know, which which ruling is better? Right? The rule that rewards the hunter and creates incentives, this is the Pearson dissent, or the rule that rewards the jerk and the certainty. This is the Pearson majority. This is your policy, right? This is your this is your question where you can shine a little bit and show me that you actually understand how incentives work. Okay, so let's go to the question. Okay. Um, all right, so the question, the answer is estimated. So if the judge follows Macintosh, then he's likely to declare the, I don't think the dinosaurs are Christian, uh, we, we don't know, uh, the non-Christian dinosaurs to be savages and capable of holding title. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion. Um, I would also accept, because they're smart enough to have all these rules and create a court, they are not savages, despite their, despite their reptilian skin. Either, either approach is fine, as long as you explain it, right? Then the person wrote, 
there's validation of a, a, a discovery by conquest, right? I'm sorry, acquisition by discovery. This is, again, we discussed in, in Johnson, right? If, in fact, these are savages, even though they were there first is immaterial, okay? Then the, the person turns to the hunting issue, and they specifically discuss lakes, lakes, locks labor theory, which discusses putting labor into it, mixing your labor as a way to acquire property title. And she mentions Genvy Rich, right? That was the whale case, right? That even though the person didn't catch the whale by putting all the labor into it and throwing the harpoon into it with the marking, that's sufficient to, to gain title. Then, then the student does something which I really like and which I actually asked for. If you notice, I said in the question, positive and negatives, right? I don't want you to only tell me what you think is better. I want you to, as a law clerk, objectively weigh both sides. If I ask you to do this, do this. Don't give me one-sided answers. So the downside is it's difficult to determine where the hunting begins and compare the amount of effort, right? This is the certainty issue. So, and the student, I think, does a really good job here and says, you know, the, 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 the Jersey court mimics Pearson, right? You have the role of capture, there's certainty, and it discourages hunters, right? But, but this, is, this is a certainty rule. And the student then tells me, begrudgingly, which is an interesting choice of word, but basically, barely, I think the, the certainty rule is better. Pearson is the rule. In fact, that has been the rule adopted by virtually all courts in the last 200 years. So this is like, this is like a 10 right there, right? If you want to see what a 10, that, that, that's a 10, the first one. Because it really answers the question I posed, walks through the pros and cons, gives me some policy, and then gives me a thing saying which one's better. Okay? So questions in this one. Um, you already said you could, you could either declare them savages like they did in the answer or say that they're not. Yeah. Do you, we don't need to put both of those. No, I mean, at that point, I, I mean, the, the first, go, go back to the question, right? The question says, no, no. Well, did the draft score have jurisdiction, right? The first question is, did it or not? Then I say pros and cons, right? I mean, I guess you could say if they're savages, then the court lacks jurisdiction. If they're not savages, then the court has jurisdiction. I mean, you could do it like that. But the, the balancing, I, I actually ask it very directly. I want the pros and cons. Okay. Um, I was just curious, but if you went by acquisition by conquest, could yeah. you say that that Jersey Shore did not conquest them because there's only four of them? So yeah, and I, I think that's a fair point, right? So we have we have a couple we have a couple doctrines: right? acquisition by discovery, and when we have acquisition by conquest, conquest involves killing and breaking things, right? And that wasn't done here, so you can make the argument that they failed to actually conquer the land, even though they discovered they didn't conquer it. Yes. You just answered. And see, you'll see that uh, your colleagues often put the same thing. So I'm sure you were talking about it later. There's a reason. Because you have very small mind, you know, there's only so many ways of approaching this. This student chose a discovery route. Conquest is fine. Saying that the dinosaurs are not savages is also fine. So there's like, we just have four different ways of answering this question that would be perfectly satisfactory. The, the latter part, the discussion about the hunting, um, this is pretty much what you should write. Right? That, that's more or less what I'm looking for. I mean, I, it, that's why I think this one got a 10. But this is more or less, it shows me everything I need to know. And if you notice, I'll zoom out, give you a scale. Question one is like three times as long as question two, right? And the student, I think, made a, a, a good judgment in the word count to put a lot of effort on the first question versus the second one, which is listing the future interests. But we'll, we'll get to the future interests in a minute. Okay, any questions on number one before I move on? No? Okay, I'll move on. Okay, question two. All right, so again, we need to identify the present and future interests. Very careful, in the year 1215, don't get thrown off by the dates, right? Don't tell me what the interests are in the year 2014, right? I say 1215 for a reason. That's when the grant was made. And recall, the other Magna Carta was 1217. I'm not asking of the other Magna Carta, I'm asking in 1215, at that point in time, what were present and future interests um, after the grant at the wedding for, for Bookie, uh, Fituation, King John, and King John's heirs? And I repeat again that there is no rap. Don't tell me about the rule against perpetuities. Not interested. 
So let's go back to the grant of, of, of land for Runnymede. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. Let's read it clause by clause. Okay, so Run Runnymede from King John to Bookie for life, comma. Okay, so I'm going to try and toggle between the two and see if this works. Okay, so we know from that that Bookie has life estate, right? That, that's the easy one. Everyone gets that one. That's the easy one, right? The second one, though, I think can be answered a couple different ways. I'm sure all of you uh, approach this differently. Okay, comma. Be very attentive that it's not from King John to Bookie for life, comma, but if. It's King John to Bookie for life, comma, then. And that makes a significant difference. So some of you probably put a few simple subject conditions subsequent, right? I'm guessing some of you might put that. But if you notice, the but if comes afterwards. Okay? So here we have a situation, right, where it says, from King John to Bookie for life, comma, then to Fituation's heirs, comma. If we just stop there, it looks like a fee simple period. But we don't, like Miley said, we don't stop. We can't stop. We keep going, right? <laughs> but if, but if, if I start twerking, you'll fail this class. <laughs> good thing I gave you my evaluations beforehand. I once had, I once had this professor who was not very good in law school. He was, he was pretty bad. Um, it was his first semester teaching, and he had a really rough semester. And like he gave the evaluations, right? And the second we gave him back, he was like, "Let's study some effing torts." Like he really was like, he really wanted to rub that in. So <laughs> I will, I will avoid the uh, twerking for now. Okay. <laughs> So it says, and his heirs, comma, but if situation does not survive bookie, then running me to King John's heir. So we're dealing here with some sort of executory interest, right? How do you know this? Because there's a third party involved, whatever. So let's go to how the student approach this one. Okay. So it says, F has a vested remainder in fee simple. I'm going to st stop there for a second, right? Why is it vested? Because it follows a life estate and ascertained, right? Situations ascertained. That's a person. So it's not contingent, it's vested remainder. But we don't, we can't stop. We don't stop. We keep going. But there is not a certainty that that vested remainder will remain. Why? Because it's subject to a possible divestment. Right? What's, what's the condition? If situation does not survive bookie, in other words, Bookie dies second. Fituation dies first. If that happens, the vested remainder goes away. So, so I think the way the suit described this as a vested remainder subject to divestment if F does not survive B, I think, I think that's a good way of explaining it. I'll, I'll go to alternates in a minute if anyone has any other ones. Yeah, there, there are other ways, but I think that's a good way of explaining it. Okay, then the next sentence, right? Then Runnymede goes to King John and his heirs. Okay? Whenever it's going to a third party, that's some sort of ex executory interest. Is it shifting or springing? Well, the reason why we know that, I think this is right, uh, it's a springing one is because it, it, it goes back to the grantor, the original grantor. Right? Shifting is to you know, someone else, grantor is springing. Okay? Okay. Then it says, after all this, if that happens, then the heirs of King John's get running made, right? Because in the event that Fituation does not survive Bookie, Fituation's estate gets divested, and it goes to King John and his heirs, whoever that happens to be, all right? I'm expecting that someone said that uh, Fituation had a fee simple sub executory interest, a limitation, anyone put that? Yeah, let's see what other people put. Again, there's not one right answer. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's also right, and I think that actually might be a little bit better than this. And I think we discussed this in class. But if you want to talk about levels of specificity, right? Vested remainder subject divestment is good. What you put a fee simple subject second limitation is better. So they're both right, but they're different levels. So like, this is probably this this would be a ten. This would probably be like, like an eight or a nine but it's good enough to get almost all credit. 
right? I don't, I don't again, I didn't check the scoring on this, but I mean, it's a correct answer, but I think what Ashley said was probably a little bit more accurate. Did anyone look at, yeah? Uh, this person did like abbreviations, and then also there was no explanation like what a life estate is and stuff like that. Is that okay? Oh, I, I don't need you to tell me what a life estate is. Again, it, it's, I mean, if you, if you say her, she has a life estate that lasts the duration of her life, I mean, that, that'd be fine. It wouldn't really get you too much. Um, what the person did do was he described the condition. If F does not survive B, right? So he kind of put into his or her own words how it works and used the correct terminology. I'm fine with abbreviations. You know, uh, uh, FS, fee simple, yeah. I, I, LE, life estate, that's fine. I mean, sometimes people give me FSSCS, like fee simple, subject condition, subsequent. I, I now know what that means. So you can use whatever abbreviations you like. Do you want us to tell you that the person that's uh, best remembered for the person who ascertained and going to death? That would, that would make it closer to a 9 or a 10. Yeah, I, I think this is probably like an 8, give or take. To explain the best term. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that I, you don't know what a best remainder is, but you can say it's a best remainder because it follows a termination and it's an ascertained person, right? That, that, that bumps you up more. So that would be the same situation explaining what it's bringing and uh... Yeah, yeah. And you can say it's springing because it, it goes to the grantor. And that adds like what three words, four words, right? You you, you can explain it fairly concisely. I thought that springing takes away the grantors. It no no it, it well no 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 it, springing divests the person who owns it now and gives it back to the grantor. Yeah. Would you even consider saying that? Um, F has a um, contingent remainder. Well, why would it be contingent? Because the condition for him to get it is precedent because he has to outlive Bookie in order to get it. It's not the. So, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, but if you read it, if you read it clause by clause, mm -hmm. right, it says the Bookie for life, comma, then to Fitchway his heirs. If you stop there, the condition comes later, right? So because there's no condition precedent, e even though I think you're probably technically right, it could be viewed as a condition precedent, if you read it the way I told you to with comma by comma, it's ascertained and there's no condition precedent, in which case the condition comes afterwards. So I think the better answer is vested. Yeah. Isn't it um, death is like the exception? Well, well, well it, it, death is, but this is death before a certain person though. So it's not straight up death, but here, Bookie terminates a life normally. That's a normal termination of life, right? Bookie will die, and then the other person will get it. So that, I think that's a natural termination, which is, what I think, what Emily was getting at. Other questions in this one? Um, it's not a condition subsequent. Why? It, it's not a condition subsequent uh, because the... Reading this, I think the better way is that when there's a life estate, comma, it's followed by a remainder, right? Life estates are always followed by some sort of remainder. And here the question is whether it's a vested or contingent remainder. And I think the better answer is that's a vested remainder because the person's ascertained no condition precedent, okay? I, I see what you're saying of why it's condition subsequent, but if we start from the general rule that life estates are followed by remainders, that's the better answer. But then what Ashley said is a fee simple subject of statutory limitation, that's kind of like a species of a remainder in a way. This topic drives people nuts. Try to read comma by comma, and I think, I think you'll be in better shape. If you go comma by comma, and I promise I'll use my punctuation well, I think you'll find things the same way I did, okay? But, but all of your points, I think, are fairly valid, and there's different ways of visualizing the same scenario. I think we did this in class one time, but the exact same situation could be written three or four different ways and have entirely different characterizations. So that's why the punctuation will be your friend. All right, any questions before I move on to the next one? Okay, so number three. Number three says, blah, 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 okay. All right, so we know that a lawsuit was filed. They're reopening the suit with James Madison from, from you know, 200 years earlier. Uh, I want you to talk about common law uh, misappropriation doctrine. All right, this is not a case involving the Copyright Act or anything else. 
I mean, the problem with INSVAP, you might recall, is that they basically made up copyright law, even though they were not able to do that. Okay, so what was the student write? Okay, so the, the notes taken by Madison with intent to publish them later are creation of property. Um, so the student analogizes this to the INS versus AP case, right? The same way that reporting on affairs from the World War is something that hasn't really been known yet, and you're bringing that back and trying to recreate that knowledge. So it's some, some, some type of property, okay? Right, uh, since this was based on his own observations, and really these are private proceedings, which is even uh, more interesting than the, with the war, they belong to him, they can't be copied. And I think, I think that's a quote from the case, I don't remember, uh, until the commercial value of the case has passed away, right? So in other words, this stuff is still very timely. Unlike the INS VAP case, where once they post the news on the wall, everyone knows about it, here, these are private deliberations that were not to be known for 50 years until his death. So the only way of finding out about this was to appropriate uh, 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 Madison's notes. So he wrote, the student wrote, assuming that these are the only notes in existence, uh, they, they will lose commercial value published in advance. So then, so then, you know, situation is liable to the state for any revenue from the publications. All right, so questions on that one? Almost straightforward, I think. Yeah? I got confused about the distinction between news mm -hmm. and, and the writing of the news. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even though he's just taking notes, he hasn't actually like, written them out the way, I don't know. Maybe. Well, they weren't meant for consumption, though. Okay. Right? It's not like the, the, uh, the Associated Press was writing a news story that's meant for consumption. These were meant to be private. So I think that actually makes it even a stronger case for protection. Yeah, in the back? Uh, just to know how many points that that's pretty good. I mean, that's probably like a 9 or 10, yeah. I mean, that, that's a pretty good answer. I mean, when you, when you give me cases and you're quoting from cases, that means you, you, your outline is sharp. Um, I mean, yeah, if there's like a money quote like from the case and you can quote it for me, I mean that that means like not only using a commercial outline, you've actually read the case enough to know what the what the what the important line is. Yeah. Does it matter if we're if we're specific international news in, in the case of international news, or you to get those little extra caveats, we want to say international news service be associated. You can give me an abbreviation. I, I don't know why this student wasted so many words with spelling the cases out. INSVAP is fine. I don't know why this I mean it wasn't an issue for this paper, but yeah, I don't, I don't, even just INS is sufficient. I don't need, I don't need the full case name. Samsung, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, for some reason, I was under the impression that if a document wasn't copyrighted, that there was no protection there, for copying. There's no copyright act here. We're talking a common law misappropriation, which we discussed when we did the, uh, the INS case, right? So, so very deliberately, that's what I say, do not talk about the copyright act. That's not relevant. We're talking about 1700 law. And it's only a common law action. And a common law, you could not steal someone's ideas like this. Other things in number three. Okay, let's move on. Number three, number four. Okay. Okay, so number four says uh, a lawsuit is brought against a t shirt shop. By the way, I actually went to the jury store t shirt shop. I actually got a t shirt there made by Danny, who was the, uh, their boss in season one. No one knows what that means, which is very sad. Good, yeah, I went, I went to the t-shirt shop in Seaside Heights. They weren't there that day, they were so upset. So the cast of Jersey Shore, they went like on a side trip somewhere else in Jersey, they went there, I was so angry. I went there for my birthday, it was a 2010 or 11, I can't remember. I was very unhappy. I was, anyway. Yes. You should, it's, it's, it's important cultural knowledge. Makes you feel so. I'll make sure. <laughs> I'll never feel like Number four. Number four. Okay, so they're, they're bringing a suit against the t-shirt shop for the, you know, the female dinosaur with the hair and the fist, the, the hair, you know, the, the bump and the leopard, uh, leopard prints, right? So the student wrote, uh, if the likeness of the image of the dinosaur is equivalent to that of the likeness of the robot in the Samsung commercial, Okay, so this person is basically drawing the obvious analogy between the Samsung case and the uh, a dinosaur case. And of course, it wasn't an actual cartoon of Vanna White. It was a cartoon of a robot dressed like Vanna White. That was the issue in that case. So then we apply the holding of White to Samsung. 
And the student actually even recalled that the opinion was in Judge Kaczynski's dissent, which is you know, very useful and not necessarily necessary. Uh, uh, if you rule in favor of Vanna, according to Judge Kaczynski's dissent, um, by the way, when I taught this last year, in the textbook, they only put the dissent in there. Your book actually changes. You have the full opinion, but this one, they only had the dissent in the book. So that's why that person's writing about this. Uh, uh, if he rules in the favor of uh, uh, a B, he's actually expanding his rights, and you're basically doing more than just protecting your publicity, you're actually stifling speech. Okay, and the person also discussed uh, fair use and parity, which I think I mentioned in class briefly. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it this year, which is something which says, oh, wow, they're actually paying attention. Right? It's, it's not really in the book, but I'm pretty sure I discussed parity. They talk about Saturday Night Live and other things, so there are uh, uh, little things in there that tell me, okay, this, this student's paying attention to the, the mis miscellany I say in class. All right, questions on that one? Oh, I don't. That's pretty. That's probably nine or so. I mean, that was that was that was that was a pretty good answer. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the last one. Okay. I think the last one's probably the trickiest one uh, uh, because it involves a lot of facts. So it says uh, uh, the Queen files suit uh, about Runnymede. Okay. And then and then. File suit, and he's claiming that Fituation's heirs own Runnymede. Then uh, uh, A intervenes, says no, actually, Little John, uh, that's the, the, the baby of, of Bookie, uh, uh, owns Runnymede. Okay, so I'm looking for you to tell me about the, the QE2, uh, uh, the heirs of the Fituation, over they are, and, and Little John. So let's go back and, and revisit. The, the two different grants. So this is the one from 1215. And again, we said that Runnymede from King John to Bookie for life, then to Fituation's heirs, comma, but if Fituation's not survived Bookie, then to Runnymede, then Runnymede to King John as heirs. What makes this question annoying is that they die at the same time. And I did that on purpose. This was not, I mean, I, I, I wanted to, to see how you think this through. Um, and there are probably a couple of different ways to think this through. So we know that Snooky, Snook, she has a life estate, and she's had it for roughly 800 years. Okay? Once Bookie dies, it would go to Fituation and his heirs. Okay? But because Fituation's also dead, it would probably go to King John and his heirs. What makes this even more complicated is is little john the heir and i think i mentioned this in class but generally speaking you can't have a gap between heirs if bookie's dead and a child's born from a corpse it is entirely clearly if that's bookie's heir because it has to be a continuous lineage and even when we're talking about a few minutes there's actually cases on this where there's like a small gap between the death of the mother and the birth of the child that gap may render them not heirs okay the second one we have to think about is our, our De Jersey code, right? So all land that's been granted by King John will never eschat, but will revert to the heirs of King John. So effectively, think about the interaction of these two, right? If the land goes to King John and his heirs, under the first one, he has it. What if King John has no heirs? It would eschat. But this statute says it can't eschat. So I put a little puzzle, right? It's, it's, a, it's a little it, it deliberate, a, a, a loop. So let's see how our, our, our student referred to this one. Student wrote, which I, I think this is a better answer, but I'm open to other alternatives. Um, whether it refers to the grant given in 1215 or the one from 1217, it matters not. I think they're trying to be very colloquial, you know, very, 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 very British. It matters not. Um, in both cases, running me belongs to the heirs of King John. Okay. With respect to the grant, F did not survive B, didn't trigger the executor interest and divesting FO's interest, which gave running to King John as heirs of fee simple. In other words, because they died at the same time, the way the person read, and I, I don't think this is necessarily wrong, I don't think there's only one answer, effectively, because they died at the same time, it just struck out this condition. Which I think that's a reasonable way of reading it. I mean, I don't have, a, I don't necessarily have a right answer in my, in my mind, but 
I think you effectively strike out that condition and says to book you for life, then the King John is heirs. Okay? So that's the first part of the, of the student's answer. Okay? So I think this is right that, that EF has no claim to Runnymede. Okay? But then, who are the heirs of King John? And I think here the answer has to be Lil John, right? John II, and also the Queen. Because, I mean, this is, you only need to know this, but effectively, the British monarch is considered one lineage, right? The, the House of Windsor has been standing for some time. And the student wrote, you know, based on their biological relationship. So the, uh, if we're going to talk about Persterpes, if you will, uh, the, the son of King John will take a huge share, and the great, 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 hundred greats, you know, grand niece of whatever King John probably takes a very neg negligible share. So effectively, I think the better answer is Lil John has it in, in something close to fee simple, uh, if not its entirety. But the, the insight here that I think is right is that the, the 1217 condition doesn't really change the equation because the condition struck out. Okay. Did anyone address this question differently or, or see a different answer, which I, I'm welcoming uh, alternatives because, again, there's not one right answer to these. I don't have, a, I don't have one answer in mind. Anyone else address this a little bit differently? No? Everyone, everyone saw it this way? Good. Okay. Well, I think that, that's good. It's a good question then. All right. Um, and I think, okay, so that, that's it for the, the exam. Um, other questions, broader meta questions, things on your mind? Did you just mention that the gap does make any difference, or it does not make any difference? It, well, if it's a few minutes, it's okay? Well, no, no, actually, I mean, there, there's case law on this. I think I might mention it briefly in class. There are problems with inheritance when, say, um, the usual example goes like this, right? Uh, uh, mother, I'm sorry, father donates his semen. Mm -hmm. Father dies. Then after the father's dead, the mother is inseminated with the semen, and the mother gives a birth. Is that child the heir of the father? And, and there's a number of decisions saying that they're not, although the modern trends is saying they are. Because like, can, can that child receive the social security benefits as a survivor of the father, even though the child wasn't conceived till after the father was dead? So this is like almost like a, a spin on that, right? If the child is delivered after the death of the mother, can that be considered um, the heir? I can go either way on that one. It really can go either way. The older doctrines say, I mean, the older doctrine would be, it would be impossible to deliver a child after the mother's dead, but with medicine today, it's actually feasible. So I, I think you probably make an argument either way. But it's not, I mean, they didn't address that. Did it's, not, it's not dispositive in this issue. I mean, what you could say is that little John is not an heir, therefore Queen Elizabeth takes it. Right. I mean, that's how you would address that one. Other questions, not just about the exam, but the class, anything else, things in your mind. Yeah? Sorry if you already answered this, but does soft test program uh, have any word count? Or it it does, as a word count. Okay. And if you haven't already, I think they'll let you do a sample just to test out the software. Do that, check out the word count, make sure you find it. You don't want to find yourself scrambling the day of the exam where, where it is, because a proctor, I promise you, will have no idea what where it is. It's actually weird, though. I'm not allowed to be in the room when they're proctoring the exams. My first semester teaching, I tried to make the room to wish people good luck, and like, the proctor threw me out. And probably there's some sort of policy where I can't be in the room when you're doing so I, I won't be there. Uh, and it's not because I don't care, but I apparently am not allowed. I'm glad I didn't bring cookies. I was thrown out without cookies. Anyway, other questions? Are you going to take questions to a certain period of yeah, I mean, I don't want to set a deadline, but try and get them in early rather than later because I don't want to have to run out of time and not answer them. So, so my preference is I don't go over the entire things, but specific questions I'll answer them. If you have specific questions about the exam, I'll answer them. But I'm not going to review entire 500 essays. Yeah. If you need to meet with me next week, email me, and we'll find a time. Going once, going twice. Good luck, everyone. See you uh, never, I guess. No, I'll, see, I'll see you next semester. Yeah. yeah. Uh. <laughs>